مثير للجميع نفسها في مراكب في فيديو بهاي الأمسي باسم مركز السبيل إحنا مستضافين اليوم عند كنيسة المسيح الإنجيلي بقرد الحاف الأسيس أبو رحمون دعانا وفتح لنا المحل محل بعيد لنا إشي كتير فشكرا كتير للكنيسة وشكرا للأسيس أبو رحمون وشكرا للمجلس اللي أدعونا السماء المحل واشتركوا معنا في هذا اللقاء لقاءنا الليلي مميز جدا انا بقول هو اول لقاء من سلسله لقاءات السبيل 2015 وقدامنا لقاءات كثير ثانيه بس اليوم احنا في العالم بهلبو يوم استرالي انا ما بعرفش ايش بيعني بالضبط يوم استرالي ممكن نساله ومعنا الاخ الاسترالي وهي اجت صدفه انه اليوم هو جاي محاضرنا فبحب ارحب بالدكتور ريفرند جريجوري جين من استراليا من بريسبان دكتور جيبري هو احنا عرفناه من اركان مدير رئيس اصدقاء السبيل في استراليا ولا يزال يعمل مع اصدقاء السبيل هو اليوم سكرتير جمعيه اصدقاء السبيل في استراليا فهو قريب جدا علينا مع كل الوقت ما كناش احنا بنعرف استرالي بس نعرف استرالي نصراوي فهو اللي بيكون في الناصرة بيكون بين اهله وفي بلده اهلا وسهلا دكتور جريجوري دكتور جريجوري جينكس اسيس عندي كانت معنا من كنيسه الانجيلي من بريسبان دكتور جريجوري استاذ في علم الكتاب المقدس في جامعه ماري فرانسيسي اللاهوت في بريسبان وبذات الوقت عالم اثار او باحث اثار وإله على القليل خمس سنين بيهتم بالاثارات الاخيره اللي عم تنعمل في الجليل خاصه حوالي بحر الطبريه وبالذات في بيت سيدا حيث انه عم بيعمل كمدير او مشارك في إدارة الأبحاث اللي عم بتصير في الحفريات في بيت سيدا وإلنا خمس سنين كل سنة في عنا مجموعة من شباب الناصرة بروحوا يوم مع الفرقة تبعته لمن بيجي بيشتغلوا كمان بالحفريات وبظن إنه هذا أعطاه دافع كثير شعره لأول مرة شبابنا قديش العلاقة هني وأرضنا وتاريخنا وماضينا واليوم طلبنا منه انه بده يقدم لنا محاضره عن الحفريات ولقيتها فينا اللي عم بيلاقوها خاصه في منطقه الجليل ومنطقه الناصره انا بديك له الكلام برحب في يو باسمكم ولكم دكتور جريج النازريت يو ار نازرين ان اوستراليا نازرين اند وي سيليبريتينغ توجذر اوستراليا دي ان نازريت I really don't know what Australia Day is. Maybe you can tell us about it. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to hear from you all the new excavations you did and uh, what's concerning us in our excavations in Gary. Okay. Welcome to Nazareth. Ahlan Bika, Auntie. Thank you. Here comes the bravest man in the room. I will try to speak slowly and I'll try to speak in English rather than Australian. So we'll see how we go. Elia will translate. So my plan is to spend about 45 minutes just opening up the topic so that we are then in a good position to have some conversation. The, um, the presentation is being recorded and that's why I'm sitting down, so I stay in the camera range. 
and it will go on online if you want to look at it later. The program is going to be recorded and is going to be in front of the laptop to show you the talk and the talk. And then you can see it after you finish the program. So my plan tonight is to speak about some fairly basic uh, trends and dynamics within archaeology and to and and in particular to focus perhaps on some questions about Nazareth in the first century. Uh, وبعدين نفتح المجال إذا بتحبوا تسمعوا أو تسألوا أشياء عن الناصرة ومنطقتها. Okay. So um, the first few slides Violet has already done for us. And I'm in Australia, Medina Brisbane, um, Brisbane. It's a city on a river. بلد على نهر. Um, I teach at Saint, whoops, I teach at St. Francis Theological College in Brisbane, which is the Anglican Seminary for Brisbane. These buildings are about 150 years old, and that's old in Australia. في أستراليا هاي عمارات قديمة جدا عمرها مية وخمسين سنة مية وخمسين في أستراليا يعني قديم كثير. It's baby here. As Violet mentioned, I work at the Bethsaida excavations the past five or six years. بعمل في حفريات بيت صيدا للسنوات الخمس أو الستة الأخيرة. Um, these are just a, just a couple of photos in case you haven't been there recently. This is a first century street from one part of Bethsaida. Um, that's me at work at, at uh, Maktabi. An open air office. Open air office here at my desk. I bring friends from around the world to help me particularly with the heavy work. That's why you have young men at the dig. <laughs> and I oops, also bring friends from locally to assist as well. Okay. So my particular interests are in the uh, Islamic period and I'm focusing on the coins, the uh, other remains to do with the Mamluk era. And clearly the photographer did not know that that coin should be 90 degrees the other way. Uh, Okay, so I'm learning to read the coins and moving into some history of this period. We're particularly trying to reconstruct in my area of the dig what was happening in the Mamluk period, that's the uh, 13th, 14th and 15th century. في القرن الرابع عشر والخامس عشر بالفترة المملوكية يعني المماليك اللي كانوا يحكموا. Okay. So um, this some of this work which I'll be referring to tonight has been published in this book chapter which is and it's also available online as you can download it. موضوع الليلي منشور في كتاب هذا الكتاب هنا. ممكن تشوفوا الكتاب هذا على الإنترنت. and and it also has informed a chapter in one of my recent books. وهذا أصحاح من أو فصل من كتابه الأخير. which you can download from. كمان تقدروا تحصلوا على الكتاب من الموقع هذا اللي مبين. okay now to get into the work. ندخل بالموضوع. okay so what is archaeology? ما هو علم الآثار؟ 
Ake, of course, is Kadim or old. Taban Arki and Kadim. And Logos, of course, is word or study or matter. Logos, Tane Elem, Audirasi. So in, we have words like theology, thinking about God, talking about God, study of God, theos, logos, theology. So archaeology is a fairly recent field of study and really developed in the 19th century. علم الآثار هو نسبيا جديد وتطور كثير في القرن التاسع عشر. And it's always been a mix of religion and politics and history and power. وكان دائما مختلط مع السياسة مع التاريخ ومع الدين. In the 19th century, it was the British and the French, the Germans and the Russians. Um, Spying on the land of Palestine, basically, in the name of archaeology. And of course, more recently, there are the politics of Israel and Palestine, who you dig, where you dig, what you keep. So in terms of the big picture, there are a number of chance elements. First of all, archaeology can only work with something which has survived from the past. So we have this much, like an iceberg, okay? Most of the past has probably not survived. And that's the effect of weather and climate and politics and all kinds of things which affect So first is, has it survived? Second is, do we find it? If we don't find it, we do not study it. So, for example, at Bethsaida, for most of the last 1,000, 1,500 years, it was lost, forgotten. So, first it must survive, second we must find it, third, who finds it? Does it go to the antiquity shop or does it go to the makaf, to the museum? In the 19th century and in the 18th century, archaeology was mostly about collecting antiquities to put in a rich man's house in Europe. Whereas today we want to study the object and we need to know its provenance, where it comes from, exactly where it was found. اليوم بنجرب نلاقي الأغراض الأثرية 
وندرس بالضبط هاي الاغراض منين اجت وكيف وجدت. And the last item to mention of course is who has political power over that place at this time. والشيء الاخير هو لمين السلطه؟ مين اللي متسلط على هاي الاثار واللي بده يكون هو المراقب عليها؟ So for example um, uh, if you're doing archaeology on the West Bank if you're doing archaeology on the Golan if you're doing archaeology in northern Iraq مثلا اذا في شخص بيعمل حفريات في الضفه الغربيه او في هضبه الجولان او في شمال العراق اليوم so all of these factors are random factors which affect what we can do, what we find, how we treat it. Now, a change. Um, another principle to put into our conversation is the idea that history has three clocks. اللي بقول انه التاريخ يشبه ثلاث ساعات. This was actually a contribution from a French historian. صديق مؤرخ فرنساوي اعطانا الفكره هاي. So we talk about the long durée, the um, clock one. بنحكي عن فتره طويله بنسبه الساعات او الفترات. This is the slow clock of geological time. Like Palestine uh, between Africa and Asia. It's been there a long, long time. Then there's the middle, this is, this is a bit like Goldilocks and the three beds, okay, but this, the middle one is a medium clock. And this, this is the period of time that might last 300, 500 years. So this is cultural time. Language, religion, institutions, technology. And these things feel like they never change, but they do. And the third clock. This is the fast clock of what happened today. How many eggs did the chicken lay this morning? Did you have for lunch? Who did you blow your horn at in the traffic? Okay. Everyone, I realize, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so history moves on these three clocks. Okay. And most history is about the middle clock. But we want to know about everyday life. Of one person. So one of the conversations we might have later is about how these three clocks interact as we do history. So now we'll shift to the archaeology and the Bible. So we're dealing with artifacts, objects, and literature or text. 
وعن ادب او ثقافي او اللي بنسميه نصوص كتابي يعني. Archaeology is interested in objects. علم الاثار بيهتم بالاشياء بالاغراض. For an archaeologist, a text is an example of technology rather than a text to read. بالنسبه لعالم الاثار okay. النص هو شيء من التكنولوجيا مساعد. We'll look at the language, the alphabet, the uh, paper, the material, and we'll look at the contents. بنطلع على الغرض اللي قدامنا ورق او كتابي او شو اللي موجود او المحتويات. And we know that many ancient rulers exaggerated. وبنعرف انه كثير من الحكام او الملوك السابقين كانوا يضخموا الامور كثير. So we will test everything and question everything. فبنمتحن كل شيء وبنشك وبنتساءل عن كل شيء. And then we have the Bible. في عنا التوراة كتاب المقدس. Which tells the story of the Jewish and then the early Christian people. والكتاب المقدس بعطينا تاريخ اليهود وتاريخ المسيحي الأول. Archaeology offers different information about that story. العلم الآثار بعطينا قصة يمكن تختلف شوي عن القصة الموجودة في الكتاب المقدس. Sometimes it agrees with the Bible, and sometimes not. بعض المرات العلم الآثار بيتفق مع الكتاب المقدس، بعض المرات لا يتفق. So it's it's a it's a mixed experience. فاختبار مختلط. And we may want to talk about that later as well. يمكن رح نكتب نحكي عنه بعدين. So to give some examples of slow time and different information, I'll have three passages from the scriptures. So example one is slow time. In Deuteronomy 26, verse 5, the Israelite who brings their offering to the altar is to start by saying, A wandering Aramean was my father. Yes, Aramean, Ta'ian. Correct. <laughs> Good. So, so that's an example of something which is about the big picture and the long period of time. And archaeology would confirm that, that the Jewish people are a subset of the Aramean people. إنه اليهود هني جزء من الآباء الأراميين. Example two. مثال آخر. Second Samuel chapter ten. David defeated the Arameans and they became subject to him. سموئيل الثاني الأصحاح العاشر. الملك داود غلب أو هزم الأراميين وصاروا عبيد لداود. This is more complicated. Bethsaida was an Aramean city. But it was never conquered by David. In fact, he married the daughter of the king of Geshur, which we think was Bethsaida. داود تزوج من بنت ملك جيشر جيشر اللي هي بيت صيدا. So he's married into the family of the other king rather than capturing the city 
and destroying it. So it's a little bit more complicated. This is also the, um, the historical clock, the middle clock. Thalathin. Thalatha, number three. Thalatha. Okay, now the fast time. Second Kings 25. Nebuchadnezzar Neza captures Jerusalem in 586. If you go to the Israelite tower in Jerusalem, you can see the arrowheads on the ground from the siege of Nebuchadnezzar. So that's an event that happened on one day, but we can find the evidence. So, slow clock, medium clock, fast clock. Okay, change again. <laughs> Archaeology in the Galilee. Remember what I'm doing here, what I'm trying to do here, is to set us up for a conversation. So, in its early years, early stages, biblical archaeology focused on scripture. They looked especially for the places that were mentioned in the Bible. Had the Bible in one hand and the spade in the other. And they were especially interested in big things. Monuments, cities, holy places. More recently, the focus has changed, and especially in the last 30, 35 years. This is very important for, for work in the Galilee. Galilee has very few monuments, very few major cities. Galilee was never the center of an empire. We are someone else's backyard. Tyre, Damascus, Samaria. Okay. So Galilee has few major cities. Betshan is about the only one, and very few monuments. So we focus on villages, not cities. And we're picking up the leftovers, the everyday materials left by people, the things they threw out or they left behind. We pick up their coins, their pottery, 
their fishing hooks, their jewelry. And we look for connections. Coins tell us who's in power and who are we trading with. And the pottery we use in the cottage, in the house, tells us something about the family. And we'll talk more about that shortly. So, there are three major questions about Galilean archaeology. One of the questions is, what is the influence, what is the impact of Antipas and Philip? These, of course, were sons of Herod the Great. When Herod dies, the emperor divided the kingdom between three sons, Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip. Antipas or Philippus, the first one. Achilles. 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 Something like that. In Arabic, you know. Yeah. Achilles. In Mata. In Mata, his name. <laughs> and after ten years, Achilles is kafut. After ten years, Achilles is kafut. Antipas and Philip want the job. They want to be king like their father. But they are only tetrarch, ruler of one quarter. So they compete with each other to win the favor of the emperor. Antipas has Hia and Perea, and Philip has the Golan. Antipas can Hona, Fi Montica is in Apiria, while Philippus can Fi Julan. And the lake is where they meet. Then there's the question of what was the economy like before the big war? It's all about the economy. <laughs> and the third question is who were these people? Were they Greeks, Jews, or Samaritans? Yunan, Yahud, or Samaritan? Okay. Now for the answers. <laughs> okay. So we've talked about Galilee being divided between two of Herod's sons who were competing for promotion. We see their competition in their cities and in their coins. Sephiros and uh, Tiberia. Were the cities of uh, Antipas. Modern uh, Antipas. Sapori. Sapori, yeah. Sapori. 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 And uh, for, uh, for Philip, 
um, Banias and Bethsaida. Philippos can be Banias or Bethsaida. So they're competing and naming cities after their emperor. These two men governed the region for Rome, but there were no Roman soldiers based here. هذول الأميرين خلينا نقول حكموا هاي المنطقة باسم الرومان ولكن ما كان في وجود للجيش الروماني في هاي المنطقة في الجليل. So the Roman uh, the Roman legion was in Syria and of course in Judea. والفرق الرومانية كانت إما في سوريا أو في أورشليم في اليهودية. So that's a, a, and there's more to say, but that's a brief summary of Galilee under the Herodians. Then the economy. Sometimes scholars have suggested that the Galilee was very poor. But when we study the villages and the number of villages, we realize the story is different. And indeed, um, Jewish people were migrating from the south into the Galilee because life was better. وفي الواقع اليهود كانوا يهاجروا من الجنوب من اليهودية إلى الجليل لأن الجليل كان الوضع أحسن. And the Herodians wanted to increase the Jewish population in the Galilee. والحكم الهيرودسيين بدهن يكثروا عدد اليهود في الجليل هذا تهويد الجليل يعني من أيام هيرودس. Some things never change. Okay. <laughs> so, and that's um, one of the interesting questions is what did the people in the Galilee think about Jerusalem? And this takes us to the question of ethnicity, of population, the ethnos, the people. Yeah. There were some Gentiles, Greeks, but especially in the Golan and at Betsha, so Philip's coins have the face of the emperor. Antipas never. Because his people were mostly Jewish. So, two brothers, same emperor. Different coins. نفس الامبراطور أخوين ولكن قطع نقدية مختلفة. So from 100 BC, the population is becoming more Jewish and more Jewish. فمن سنة مية قبل الميلاد شوي شوي السكان بيكونوا يهود أكثر وأكثر. And the end. Although these are in the north, they are people from the south, and they are very attached to Jerusalem and the temple. In other words, they were not Samaritans, they were not Israelites, but they were Jews. And we see this in their 
in their plates, in their customs, and what we dig up in the. Did you find the sahoon, the hazafiyi, or the the gharad, the things that we we dig up in the hafriyat? Okay. Last change of topic. كمان تغيير أو هذا آخر تغيير مار خليفة. This is where I bring ice to the Eskimos. هاي لسا هو بدي بيع تلج لسكان الإسكيمو. Okay, Nazareth in the first century. <laughs> All right. So summary. You may be surprised, but there's a very active debate as to whether Nazareth even existed in the first century. وبدي أحكي عن الماضي والسؤال اللي يسأل عادة وفيه مش واضح بعده هل كانت الماضي موجودة في القرن الأول الميلادي؟ so I'll summarize my view then I'll quickly mention the evidence and then I'll repeat my summary. فرح أقول أو أخبر بفكرتي and the crowd will not throw me off the cliff at the end of the sermon. <laughs> okay. So my view is that Nazareth did exist in the first century, but was a very small village. It was settled perhaps only in the time of Herod. So that's 30 years or so before Jesus. So when Jesus was a child, it was a new Jewish settler community. فلما كان يسوع بعده شاب صغير كانت الناصرة مدينة أو قرية جديدة بسكان يهود. Perhaps only twenty or so families, fifteen, twenty-five families. يمكن بعض العائلات عشرين خمسة وعشرين خمسة عشر عائلة. And about three hundred people. حوالي ثلاثمائة شخص. Most of them children. معظمهم أولاد. Okay, no contraception. Okay. So, lots of babies. <laughs> so we have six, I think, six very important pieces of evidence. The basilica. The well. Uh, Mary's well. Nahazapori, Wadi Safuri, Nazareth Village, Karita Nasri, Beit Miriam, Beit Maryam, Marquis Marquis Maryam in Dwali, and the Sisters of Nazareth. Wa Dir Rahbat and Nasri. So let me very quickly just mention those six. Fa Khalina Ahkian I sit Amakin. So, you know this view. This is familiar for all of us. The Basilica and Mary's Well. And this area is probably first century Nazareth. In other words, the Franciscan compound. Okay. It's a bit bigger now. Okay. So this is a map from Yadena Alexandre. So the Franciscan compound, the old village. And the well. Okay, and um, it's about 500 meters to the well, and the village was about 500 meters by 500 meters. Okay, so the basilica, 
and I'll just I won't go through all the details we can come back to this if we need so in the time when the opportunity came to build the basilica the old church was taken down and they went right back to bedrock and so we have a that's that's most unusual to go back to bedrock. What we've what he particular what this is um um Bagati, Balamo Bagati, and what he particularly found were of course the ancient caves underneath the basilica. Some of them were lived inside. Uh, and some of them had structures on top. And well, that's perhaps enough. But the, the point is, it's very, uh, it's very undeveloped, very simple development of a farming village. Um, cisterns, olive presses, wine presses, etc. Okay. Hold that in mind because we have exactly the same finds at Beit Miriam and at the sisters. Now we move to the well. Okay. As you may remember, there were some excavations there in 1997-1998. And a detailed report in 2012. Now, of course, an ancient water system channels leading to a well is very different from a cottage. From a house. We find particular things in a well. We find jewelry, coins, um, cups. Jugs, most of which have been accidentally dropped. Okay. And of course, they wash down the hill to the bottom point, which is the well. And the well and the water system have to be cleaned periodically. Otherwise, it clogs up with mud. You may not be surprised to know the last time that Nazareth City Council did this was in the Mamluk period. <laughs> Okay. But the workers were not very good. Now, I like this picture at the back of the well. You probably think it's yik. But I like this picture. <laughs> because I see layers of history. Okay. Now when they did the well, when they cleaned the well in 1997-98, um, 
165 coins were found. And 16 of them were from the first century. Even though the well had been cleaned at least two or three times. So despite the regular well, occasional cleaning of the well, there were still some first century coins in the bottom of the well in 1998. And for me that is very important evidence that there, were a sm there was a small village here in the first century. Just a couple more things then. What is Sapori? Wadi Sapori. Okay. Ken Dark, who I know some people here know Ken, um, has been working at, uh, down the hill at the Sisters, but also working in the valley, in the Suwadi, between Nazareth and um, Zippori. He has identified a difference in culture on each side of the wadi. Those closest to Sepphoris, much more influenced by the city. And those on this side of the wadi, less influenced, more resistant. On that side of the wadi, more Hellenistic, on this side of the wadi, more Jewish. And two more, Nazareth village. As many, I'm sure everybody knows Nazareth village in this audience. It's an open space. Very careful work has been done. Uh, lots of pottery has been found. Evidence of agriculture has been found, but virtually no coins have been found. The evidence seems to suggest that the village was small and where Nazareth village is was farmland outside the village. Beit Miriam. Beit Miriam. Okay. Again, most of you will know this story. I have to say this for other people in other places. As work was beginning, of course, and I'm sure it delayed the project seriously and probably put the costs up, um, of course, as always happens, they found material which had to have a rescue excavation from IAA, Antiquities Authority. And that was done by Yadena Alexandre, who also did the Mary's Well. I've spoken with her because her report is not yet published. And her, her advice to me is that she found evidence of a first century 
courtyard house, similar to what's across the road at the Basilica and similar to what's up the hill at the Sisters. Uh, and, and consistent with a small Jewish observant village. Okay. And we probably don't need to pause on this, but you can no longer see these so easily because the building on top. But here you... So the basilica at the top, the street, the ancient remains, and the Mamluk walls, which were put above the ancient remains at a much later, about a thousand years later. Okay. And this is where we are, except we're going to stop halfway up the hill. At the <laughs> I don't normally give this lecture sitting on the spot where we're talking about. <laughs> So I have to explain to people where this is, but not <laughs> So about 100 metres from the Basilica site, we have the um, Sisters of Nazareth Convent, where ancient materials were first discovered in around about 1884, and the expert is sitting down the back. <laughs> now this takes us back to the issue of who finds the material and what they do with it when they find it. Because these discoveries were not carefully documented in the way we would do it now. Ken Dark, who I've already mentioned, has been reviewing the material from the 19th century. There are certainly substantial, significant Byzantine remains. But below the Byzantine material, simple, rustic, first century village material. And particularly what he refers to as structure one, which is part of this. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but simply to say Ken's argument is that the first century material here is consistent with Beit Miriam and consistent with the Basilica. So I'll go click, click, click. Okay, now I want to talk very briefly about graves. A number of tombs or graves have been discovered around the um, area of Nazareth and they help us to identify the limits of the ancient village because the graves were outside the village. Uh, and significantly, None of the graves begin earlier than the Herodian period. So let me just summarize again. There's occasional human presence from very, very ancient times. But 
but the permanent occupation begins in the Herodian period. It's a very small settlement, 500 meters by 500 meters. The people were religious Jews from Judea. It was almost certainly too small for a synagogue. Possibly one oven, one wine press, one threshing floor. We're talking first generation farming village. And perhaps yeah, 300, maybe 500, but tell us, no more than 500. And maybe only 15, 25, 30 families. And that's partly based on the population ratio for the size. Okay, shukran. Time for questions. So, I hope I've set you up for some conversation and some questions, and Elliot will answer all your questions. <laughs> نيح إذا شدنا شوي 